Good morning. That was a drastic unplug. Y'all ready to worship this morning? Us too, so let's go. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Has anyone else been sick this week? No? Good for you. I'm happy for you. My whole family has been sick. We're coming through it. And then it rained this morning, and I just got here. So bear with me for a second. Oh. <laughs> All right, everyone. No. <laughs> 
Good morning, Union Point Church. <laughs> Welcome to the mess we call our family. I am the biggest mess there is, um, but we are happy to have you here this morning. Visitors, friends, family, we're happy to see you. Um, we are a family of local churches on mission to lift Jesus and others in Eastern North Carolina. Um, if you feel led to give to our mission, there's a couple ways you can do that. We have some black boxes on either side of the double doors on your way out. We have unionpointchurch.com where you can give online or you can download our app. Um, it's called Union Point Church. It looks just like this. Um, and it has all the things that you need that we um, have available for you to consume, really. So sermons, podcasts, um, a lot of information is on there. <clears throat> If you feel like you want to get more engaged, if you want to sign up for things, if you want to talk to your community group, you can do that in the Church Center app, and it looks a little something like that. So sometimes if you go into the main app and you click on something, it might direct you to the Church Center app. Um, so it's good to have both on your phone at the same time. If you need help with either of these, you can go out to the, I don't know if we have a tent outside today, but maybe uh, somebody in the lobby might be able to help you out. It's in the lobby. Thank you, Rachel. Always coming through. All right, so those are our apps. Now, <clears throat> our star tree. Did anyone see our star tree outside today? There's still some stars on there. So um, we have extended our deadline to turn in your star tree gifts um, to Wednesday, this Wednesday, December 13th. So what our star tree is, is it's certain items that people have specifically stated that they need in our community. And um, we're able to pick a star, provide that item. Um, what we're asking you to do is wrap that gift and put your star on it so that we're not just shuffling through a bunch of wrapped boxes and figuring out what everything is. So if you could keep your star, put it on your gift and bring it back by Wednesday, December 13th, that would be fantastic. Next, we have our tables project. Tables Project, this is how we feed our community throughout the year. Um, so we have met our goal of 200 boxes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so cool. I feel like just a couple weeks ago, we were like, we have 60 boxes. We have hit 200. So now it's time to move on to packing those boxes. Um, so our tables packing party is going to be Tuesday, December 19th, so next Tuesday. Um, and it's going to be right here at 6 o'clock. I made my own notes. <laughs> I'm going to get things right, guys. Um, and then we're going to be distributing these boxes on Saturday, December 23rd at 9 o'clock right here. Okay, so we're going to pack them on the 19th and distribute them that Saturday. All right, next, we have our exchange program. Um, what they are going to be doing is, I think it's really cool. Um, they're going to be having a night, a spaghetti dinner, where they're going to be serving the seniors in our community. <laughs> <laughs> 65 and up. I love it. Um, they're going to be serving you spaghetti. Um, they are going to have fun games like bingo. And there might be, did I hear Christmas karaoke? Okay, if not, it, it should happen. That's not going to be people because he has to be out there singing. People. So... Um, if you are interested in the spaghetti dinner, you can um, sign up for that in the planning center. That dinner is going to be Sunday, December 17th at 5 o'clock. Okay. Next, we have, I have so many papers. Next, we have our advent calendar popping up. So this is all of our events kind of together. If you want to take a picture of that, because um, there are a lot of dates and times, um, it'll be good for you to just kind of take a picture of that and know what's coming up this month. Guys, this is our time, right? Like this is our time to serve our community. Um, this season is all about Christ, or it should be. Um, and so our service to our community is really impactful. 
Um, so definitely take some pictures of things like that. You might notice the Wacky Tacky Christmas Sunday coming up next Sunday. Wear tacky things. Yeah, so be a little tackier than you already are, okay? <laughs> JK. Um, so that is going to be next week. It's our favorite Sunday of the year. At least it's mine. It's so fun. People get really creative. My mom always wears a tree skirt as a poncho. And, like, that's <laughs> as far as she takes it. Barb just can't do it. But um, <laughs> it's a really good time. Get creative as you want to be. All right. And you might see up there we do have our Christmas Eve Eve service on the 23rd. That is going to be at 630 on both campuses. Um, now, children are going to be leading us in some worship. <laughs> what? I didn't understand your text. Yes. Oh. The kids are going to help and then for part of the service. But I'm going to sing a few songs first. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a kid's service before I was telling everyone to come. It's a big service. It's our candlelight service. But we are going to have our children involved in leading us in worship, K through 5. So if you want um, to sign them up for that, you can do that in the Church Center app. or the yeah. And then you can also get a flyer from Mandy over at Point Peeps. And it can tell you a little bit more about what our kids are going to be doing for our Christmas Eve Eve service. And then I'm so excited on Sunday, Christmas Eve morning, we are going to be meeting. We're going to have one service. I love a one servicer, don't you? You just get to be with the whole family. Um, so I'm excited about that Christmas Eve service. It's going to be on the 24th at 10 o'clock. Um, and then the following Sunday is going to be our Sabbath Sunday. So we're not going to have any services. Everyone is going to be able to just rest um, after a crazy Christmas season. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I did it. Let's pray and get back into worship. Father, thank you um, for so much. Thank you for these people. Thank you for this season. Thank you for how much you're growing and stretching us in this time where, um, you know, the world can really be looking pretty dark. And Lord, I just pray that you um, show us, just show us how much power you have and how that power lives in us, Lord. And I pray um, as we worship that you just fill us up with that power. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken.
We just praise you, Father. Yes, give her a hand. Just thank you for your merciful heart and for your character, Lord. We just praise you this morning. Continue to be with us as we hear your word and be with Aaron. Just open our hearts for what you have for us today. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning, church. Um, That song kind of makes you want to marinate a little bit. Um, that that's the beauty of, of songs like that. Um, many of us think, oh boy, they're they're so repetitive. What's wrong with repeating that God is slow to judgment and desires to give mercy? I mean, I don't I don't know how many times I could hear that over and over and get tired of it. Because I don't know about you, but I need some mercy in my life. Yeah? I mean, I know, I know who I am, and uh, I, I need his mercy, and I'm thankful for that. So maybe you need to marinate a little bit in that today. He desires to give you mercy. He desires to give you mercy. I'm Aaron. It's good to be with you guys. I'm one of the elders and pastors here. I don't say that every week. We don't put a lot of stock and titles around here. So I've had some people ask me, who exactly are you, new people? <laughs> and... Um, so that's, that's who I am. But uh, I, it's good to be with you guys this morning. I'm looking forward to jumping in our Advent series, week number two. And I heard John finish uh, by 10 o'clock last week in this service. I was pretty surprised. So uh, <clears throat> I told him whatever time he left on the table, I would take up today. <laughs> but uh, we're in the middle of our Advent series, and maybe for some of us, um, Advent is one of those things that I think maybe if you are, have been in church a lot of your life, which I think if you're in the South, um, even if you've just recently moved to the South, you, you can't throw a rock without hitting the church building, you know. So we have some familiarity with church culture. And I, I think there's two different segments of people, those who have probably grown up celebrating Advent in its tradition, and a lot of that comes from at times more of a high church backdrop. What I mean by high church backdrop is like Episcopalian, maybe even Catholic, um, uh, it, it's, it's just something that you focus on. Maybe some of us that maybe come from, I love how they always term that in church culture, low, low, low church. <laughs> I'm like, low church and high church. I love how we put those definitions on things, you know. Uh, but maybe some of us haven't really ever embraced Advent. But here, here's what Advent simply is. Advent means arrival. It means that we're in a situation and, and, and place of where we're expectant of a coming. Uh, What we're celebrating right now, like in this season, is is the arrival, yes, of Jesus as a baby. God, as the protagonist in the story, writes himself into his creation to redeem it. You talk about mind-blowing. The way that God decides to rescue the world is to put himself in it. Like not just the creator of it, but a participant within it in the flesh. Boy, that could bake your noodle today just thinking about that a little bit. So so we're expectant, we're we're celebrating that Jesus came that first time as a baby. He lived the fullness of life. He lived a perfect human life so he could redeem us by giving himself to death and then coming out on the other side in resurrection. So we celebrate that this season, Jesus the baby boy. But what as believers now we should do post-Pentecost Now in the church, birthed in Jesus, we should live in Advent awaiting his second coming. Everything about this celebration of Jesus' coming and all the prophecies that were fulfilled when Jesus came that first time, they will also be fulfilled when he arrives in his second coming. And so for us as believers today, we should live in expectation in Advent that Jesus is going to return. And if I don't see him break through the clouds today, if I pass away, I'm going to be with him forever anyways. So he's going to come no matter what. So let's live expectantly. And Advent is sort of hinged around these ideas. The foundational principles of Advent are hope, peace, joy, and love. And last week we talked about hope. And John talked about how hope in Jesus, how hope in the kingdom is greater than our past, It's greater than our sins, and it's greater than death. I don't know about you, but that's good news, friends. We have hope in Jesus. i got to be honest. I shared down east last week. 
I was looking forward to sharing with you on hope, but John and I had to flip Sundays, so that's kind of, you know, I preached hope down there. But, but the reason I was excited to preach hope this year was because this year I'm most grateful for hope. I am most grateful for the hope that Jesus brings to our life. And the only times that you can really embrace what hope really means is to go through some of the darkest, deepest valleys in your life. Hope isn't a means to escape the, the dark valleys. Hope is something that meets you in the dark places. <laughs> Isaiah writes about Jesus' first coming as, as a baby. And, and he writes in that prophetic word, he says, For unto us, like present tense, a child is born. Jesus is not going to be born for hundreds of years after that passage. But Isaiah is writing it like it's already happened. <laughs> this is a sidebar, but anything the king promises even if it's in the future, it's as good as done. It's already happened. So Isaiah writes about Jesus. For unto us this child is born. To darkness has come a great light. That's hope. For me, man, I, I don't know about where you've been, but I have needed the hope of Jesus more than ever in my life. Because there's a lot of things in this world that tells me there is no hope. There's a lot of things about my past that want to convince me there is no hope. There's a lot of things about the sin that sometimes I'm like, I can't believe I'm still dealing with that. Anybody been there before? And it feels hopeless at times. That is what the enemy desires is for you to feel hopeless and defeated. But in Christ, hope is greater than any of those things. And hope is simply this. I, I kind of share this with Downey, so I'll share it with you this morning. Hope is formed in tension. And it's produced in patience. Hope is about awaiting, living in the present with expectation of the future. Aligning my life with what will arrive on that day. Aligning my life with what is happening in God's kingdom right now. That's what it looks like to live in hope. So if you live in hope, then naturally I think what hope does is it begins to produce something in the midst of your life, which is peace. And I think peace is probably one of the most difficult things that many of us really can get our heads around. Because in our world, there's so much hostility. There's so much conflict. It doesn't matter if you watch the news or if it's at your family dinner table. There is conflict. Where people are, there's conflict. And sometimes peace seems elusive. It seems elusive because the conflict abounds. I, I love further in Isaiah's writings, he's sort of forecasting yet again about what it will look like when Jesus returns in the consummation of his kingdom. Uh, and, and it's not about really his first arrival here. This is about his second coming. But, but Isaiah says in chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, and I think it paints a picture for us what peace looks like in the kingdom. He says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears here, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. You want to talk about an awesome picture there. Jesus don't even have the reach for the sword. He just breathes with a word and annihilates the enemy. Righteousness, verse 5, shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Here's the picture of peace. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Are you kidding me? A, a lion eats straw? 
That's what peace looks like. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in a viper's den. Wouldn't suggest that right now. <laughs> I love verse 9. It says, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. That's the picture of peace that Isaiah gives us that we're wrestling around this morning for our own lives in this current situation we're in. So let's pray, and then let's dive into peace a little bit, okay? Jesus, thank you for the prophet Isaiah's words, for the foretelling of what was to come, and I think for the present word of alignment, that we should live as though this is the reality because it is. So, Lord, today as we embrace peace. Would you help us, uh, Lord, to trust you and where you lead us? Lord, would you bring to the surface to those things that have held us from peace today? And Lord, would you let us release those things to you so you may bring healing into our lives? And we pray this in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. So the biblical idea of peace, uh, the word for peace in Hebrew tra tradition is shalom. And shalom and peace in that culture, it means to make whole. It means to complete. It means to restore. If you are in peace, then the idea is you are whole. You are fully put together. Irene, which is the Greek word, means to make peace between humans and creator. Literally, in the New Testament, that word is used to describe that Jesus is our peace amidst the war. He is the one who has made peace between us and the Father. He has forgiven and removed and made whole. He has given us peace. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, he says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then I love what the promise is that follows that. And the peace of God, <laughs> the wholeness of God, the restoration of God will surpass all understanding and guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything. Boy, is there not a lot to be anxious about. <laughs> I love what Charlie said in our elders' prayer this morning. It was a good word. I, I didn't even, I mean, I didn't even know that it was coming to even talk about it from this perspective. But Charlie said 90% about what has formed us and makes us believe what we believe is developed at a place of hurt. 90% of what we believe about ourselves or about situations or about this world is based in the hurt that we have experienced. And is that not the truth? So much about the anxiety in our life is built around the hurt that we have experienced. Why do people hold on to hurt like they do? It's like tightening the grip on a buried splinter in your hand. Why would you do that? Because the truth is, if you embrace the hurt even more instead of peace... What it does is give you a false sense of identity and a false sense of security. Because if you just hold on to the hurt, at least you won't have the trust again. At least if I hold on to that hurt, I'll never have to experience that pain again. Is that not ludicrous? But that is what many of us live in, and that is the anxiety that wells up within us, and that is the thing that removes us from the peace that God wants to bring into the midst of our lives. So peace is one of those things that, that guys, i got to be honest with you, you're not naturally in your sinful condition. You are not naturally in the peace of a place of disposition to live in peace. It's something that you actually have to step into. You have to begin to embrace peace. You have to embrace it. 
You have to move in favor of it. I love what Isaiah reminds us about Jesus. He says that Jesus, he's going to live righteous and faithful, and he's going to do it because he lives in fear of the Lord. He lives in fear of the Lord. You want to know where peace begins? It begins at the fear of the Lord. Wholeness begins at the fear of the Lord. It's not about fear from the perspective of that you're scared to death that he might smite you. (laughs) It's not from the perspective that you're fearful that he will crush you. It is from a place of understanding that he knows better and he's far greater and he gives mercy instead of judgment, so I will trust what he asks of me. That's what fear of the Lord means, to submit fully in allegiance to the Father. So you have to embrace peace, and to embrace it means to live in the fear of the Lord. So what what often keeps us from embracing peace? I think it's the flip side of fear of the Lord. It's fear of everything else. Fear is the enemy of peace. Fear is the enemy of peace. So often we don't embrace peace because we have fear of what someone else may do, or how they may respond, or what may happen in this world, or how how, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. So what does that mean for my life? I'm scared to death, and that is what keeps us from embracing peace. Here's some truths about fear this morning. A fearful people are a disoriented people. A fearful people are a disoriented people. You don't have to look any further than our current cultural context to believe that reality. That when people are motivated and saturated in fear, they do some of the dumbest things. They act in the most foolish of ways. We're convinced of things that would in any other time be the most ludicrous thoughts to ever embrace. Fearful people are disoriented. When you're living in fear, it's hard to tell which is up and down, which is right and left. What should I do? You know what often fear in that, that, that operation looks like? It means you're making irrational decisions in a moment's glance. You move in fear in a way to just make a decision that you normally wouldn't be inclined to do. Anybody ever been there before? You start to act irrational because of the disorientation. The fearful people are a disoriented people. If you live in fear, then you're disoriented away from the peace of God. You're not embracing the way of the kingdom. A fearful people are a, this is the difficult one, are a defeated people. If fear has settled into your spirit, you're already done. If fear has settled in, if you allow fear to have the final say in your life, then it moves you to a place of defeatedness. It leads you to a place of hopelessness. If I live in fear of the world, in the fear of another, in the fear of hurt, in the fear of letting it go, or whatever it is, if I live in that fear, then what I'm saying is those things I'm fearful of have the final say in me. There is no hope outside of getting released from this. There is nothing that will help me. Fearful people are a defeated people. So when we look at peace, what does peace bring in the midst of what fear so often saturates? Peace can bring us endurance. Peace can bring us endurance. Paul writes, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus moved towards the cross in endurance because he lived in the fear of the Lord and in peace. He lived in the peace of God. Peace is found in the heart of pain. Peace is found in the midst of difficulty. It's not determined by the struggles, but is determined by the future destiny. Where we will be. I can live in peace right here and endure this moment when the world throws everything at my feet. I can have peace right here because I know what the end is. 
I can remove myself from fear. I can step back and take a breath for a minute and just rest in peace because I know who has my future. There's no point to fear this world or what it may do because it cannot do anything but destroy the body. But what can any man do to destroy a soul? (laughs) Anything anybody does to me can't destroy my soul if in Christ. Then what do I fear? We need endurance for the day. We need to live at a pace of shalom and rest. And that is what helps us persist on, to press on, and to endure even the worst of things, even if those things look like the cross. Here's the hard truth for us, church. So often for us as believers, we think we can only enter the peace of God if he would remove us from the situations that we're in. But what God wants to do is to bring peace right into the places that we are experiencing. You want to tell me some of the strongest people that I've ever, or let me tell you some of the strongest people I've ever seen in my life are the people that are going through hell and they seem like in their posture and their attitude they are unfaced. I'm not talking about like they're not realistic about what's taking place. I'm not talking about like at times you don't lose your head and kind of get caught in the moment. But people that refuse to give up in belief that God is good and desires to give mercy instead of judgment in the midst of a time when everything else looks like it's out of control. To the world, that is the expression of what the peace of God looks like. How can you keep following him when all that stuff keeps happening? Where else do I have to go? Where else would I have to go? Peace doesn't mean that everything is just going to be automatically perfect in your life. I've been following Jesus for over two decades. i got to be honest with you. Everything ain't been perfect. I'll actually be real with you. Some of the hardest hits I've ever taken are when I made the most commitments to follow Jesus. But what I know is, is even in the times where I'm like, I I feel like I'm, I'm a little scared, I'm anxious, I'm worried... I have seen the peace of God show up in a place where when I look back, I'm like, there was nothing I did to get through that other than to have the fear of the Lord in my life, to trust him with what may come, even when I didn't understand it or thought I was never going to get through it. Anybody there this morning? Yeah. So peace, man, it brings endurance. The next thing that peace brings is reconciliation and and, uh, restoration. Peace brings reconciliation and restoration. Notice what he says, Isaiah says in the passage. He says, hey, lion will lay with lamb, leopard with the goat. I mean, just think about the imagery here. That seems upside down. A lion eating straw? That's some of the weirdest things you could ever think about in the context that we live in and the way that our world has been shaped by sin and rebellion. But yet there it is in Isaiah's promise of what will come to pass. The father says, on that day, on my holy mountain, no one will start war or defile. But we will live in unity and in peace. That's what reconciliation and restoration looks like. So I think what God wants to do in the midst of peace so often is to bring reconciliation first with himself. He wants us to be reconciled to him, to be in right relationship, to walk with him, to walk at his pace, to trust him in whatever he calls us to do. That's what it looks like to embrace the peace of God, to be reconciled to him, and then a secondary to that, Jesus actually talks about this in the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then the second one, be reconciled to men, love your neighbor as yourself. God wants to work his reconciliatory love in us for him, and then he wants to work through us with that same love. He wants us to work in that reconciliation process with other people people. Now, the hard part about that is, is many of us got opinions. <laughs> I, I love what they say about stories, you know, there's, one, there's this side and that side and then the truth. There's always three sides, right? We shouldn't be caught up in all that. What we should desire for, regardless of whether anybody, if something happens or fractures, what we should desire for is to hope that in their life, God has the best for them, regardless of what has ever happened. 
whether you've mistreated or you've been mistreated. Either direction, reconciliation at best is to desire the best for the individual in the mix of it. What does God have for them? You can't embrace the reconciliation of God without the reconciliation of other people. And, and, and nobody's saying that we're batting at 100 on that, guys. <laughs> I mean, there's nowhere that we got 100 on that. And so often that's what judgment is, is to act like you're at 100 and everybody else is wrong. Most of the time embracing reconciliation is actually seeing the places where you yourself are in the place of that brokenness. How, how can you help move in reconciliation if you don't realize that you need it as well? So reconciliation with God and with people. I, I love what the angel says when it appears to the shepherds. It says, the angel says, fear not, <laughs> for behold, I bring good news of great joy that will be for, and I love these words in scripture, all the people. For all the people, that's reconciliation. Fear not, for the Father brings something for every person. Goodness. That's reconciliation. So, in our cultural context, in the place of upheaval, in the place of fear, in the place of uh, disorientation, how do we as believers, how do we actually embrace peace? Not just in this season, but in the entirety of our life. How do we embrace peace? I think the first and main key thing is this. You must walk with the Prince of Peace. His name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You've got to walk with the Prince of Peace. Isaiah gives us a picture of what it looks like to walk on the Prince of, with the Prince of Peace. He says that of that day, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, the root of Jesse, who's the root of Jesse? Jesus. Jesus, who will stand as a signal for the people, of him shall the nations inquire. I don't think the nations are inquiring of Jesus today, mostly. On that day, though, every person will look to Jesus to help me live in his peace. And what will he give when the nations inquire on that day? He will give rest on that mountain. It says, and his resting place shall be glorious. If you want to embrace peace this season, that means you've got to know the person of peace. You've got to walk in relationship with that person of peace. You know why I don't embrace peace a lot in my life? Because I don't want to listen to the person of peace. Jesus brings me to a situation or a circumstance. Or maybe I made a bad decision and I've got myself there. And he's walking with me and he's like, hey Aaron, you might want to. And I'm like, I'm not sure about that. The person of peace is right there with you. Do you give ear and action to what he would say or lead you in? To embrace peace is to walk with the person of peace. <laughs> Paul says in Romans chapter 15 and 13, he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. When you walk with the Prince of Peace, you live in the hope of His glory. When you walk with Him, you live in the hope of His glory. I love that word that Paul uses there, that you may abound in hope. Not just have a little bit, but abound in hope. So walk with the Prince of Peace. The next thing that you can do to embrace peace is... To welcome future peace into your present. To welcome future peace into your present. There's another portion of scripture within Isaiah's writings 
that he talks about and gives imagery again of what it will look like on that day. And he says on that day when Jesus returns, those weapons of warfare will be beat down into shovels. They will be beat down into hoes. I'm talking about like garden tools. (laughs) Plows. That's what will happen with him. You talk about an idea of peace, to take a weapon of war and make it to a play, into a thing for cultivation, for the goodness of society. That's what it will look like on that day. So in my life, how often am I carried away to, to grab the weapons of warfare that not what God has given me, but the ones I want to? The weapon of warfare of slander, the weapon of warfare of gossip, the we- weapon of warfare to tear someone down. You've been, with, you've been there? You're about to be with your family over the Christmas holidays. <laughs> it's easy to pull that weapon out, you know. <laughs> We've got to welcome the future peace into our present. And this is what, it, what happens when we do that. The first thing that peace does in the midst of, of that welcome is it helps us make peace with our past. The truth is, many of us, we have a hard time embracing the future peace of the kingdom in the present because we haven't let yet it touch the past of our life. We, we, maybe some of us today, maybe, maybe some of us, we've been journeying with Jesus for a while, but we still let the past determine who we are. I know it's under the blood, but you know, I know he says it's as far as the east is from the west, but you know, whether it's a past self-inflicted wound, whether it's a past wound that someone else has done to you, it's easy to go back to the past and try to live out of the past. But what Jesus wants us to do is to live in the present with a future perspective of what peace is, and that peace has made peace with my past. I love how that last song we sang says, my past embraced, my sin forgiven. God has embraced all of me, even my past. doesn't mean he okays it. It means he wants to heal it, to restore it, to bring peace and shalom and fullness and restoration to it. So have you allowed peace to touch your past? Have you made peace with the past? The next thing that 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 welcoming future peace looks like in the present is is to live with prayer and praise. That sounds corny in church culture because we've always heard that if you've been in church. Prayer and praise. You know, I had heard one laugh, so some of y'all never heard that before. Okay. (laughs) Notice what Paul says earlier in that verse we shared that's so familiar to us in Philippians. He says, the Lord is at hand. Okay. And because of that, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. Do you know what it means to sup with somebody? Not like, what's up? Do you know what it means to to sup? It means to eat with, to dine with, to be in relationship, to commune together. In prayer and relationship. Paul says, with thanksgiving, (laughs) let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, what prayer and praise does is unlock and unleash the peace of God in my life. When I've been the most anxious, and boy, I tell you, when you're about to preach a sermon on peace, don't be surprised when Saturday night you keep waking up in anxiety. (laughs) Anybody ever play worst case scenarios when you're sleeping? I don't know about you too, but I do my best math in the middle of the night. You know what I'm saying? Like you got all the bills coming up, you're thinking about all the ends trying to be made, and what's going to happen, what we got coming up in the next two months, and you're over here figuring it up. When you wake up, you don't know what you've done. <laughs> you're just living in anxiety, man. It's driving you, it's, 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 it's robbing from you wholeness and restoration, and I'm the world's worst at that. So, what am I supposed to do in the middle of anxiety? I should move to a place of petition and prayer. 
I should settle in just like you are with that rain on the roof. (laughs) And move in peace. So, you welcome peace into your present. You find ways to engage in making peace and not war. You find ways to make peace and not war. You, You know one of the easiest things to do to make peace? Shut your mouth. You know that everything that you think or that could be said doesn't necessitate that it must be said? Just because you're sitting around the table with some of your family and you you think you got all the answers to all their problems, you know what you need to do? Sup with them. (laughs) Don't speak to them. Eat with them. Maybe if you were honest with yourself, the things that, this, that, that, that just really get in your crawl about them are some of the things that you yourself deal the most with. But it's easy to look at them. It's easy to look at what they're doing. Making peace, man, sometimes means putting them lips together, not apart. Refusing to engage when the flesh wants you to jump in the moment to rest. Stop and live in peace. Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? Enter moments with grace and endurance, man. Grace and endurance. Maybe the best thing you can do in this season is to seek peace for relationships in your life and most of those around your family dinner table. To seek peace in those relationships. I'm not talking about if they have harmed you and they continue that pattern that you're just going to let yourself continue to get harmed. I'm talking about moving in a place of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Though you meant me harm, I will forgive you. You you know what that looks like in Jesus' life? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's peace. That's peace. That's welcoming the person of peace into the moment. Father, you see and you know. So that moment of when I I really want to lash out. That moment when I really want to read them their rights. That moment when I just can't take it anymore. Father, You see, you know, forgive, forgive. I cannot say I'm a person of forgiveness if I'm unwilling to extend it to anyone in my life. If the cross isn't big enough for all of us, then it's not big enough for any of us. It's big enough for all of us. (laughs) So how are you moving in peace this season? How are you embracing the way of peace for your life? And what would it look like in your life, in your family, in this community, if you embraced it? If you fully gave in to what God would have you to do? If you fully released your anxiety and fears and past, and sins, and hurts, and failures, and shame, and guilt into his hands, and rested in the restoration of the king. What would that look like? And what would that say to those who seek you? What would that say to them? What would they see? I'd probably submit to you it'd be something better than what I would normally be inclined to bring. (laughs) It'd be like the good dish from the person that brings the good food at your family dinner table, not the one that brings the terrible dish or no dish at all. Anyways, so, Ben, come on up. 
we're going to respond this morning. I took five minutes of John's time, so thank you. This morning as we move to the table, that, that's what we celebrate every week through communion. Communion does not save you, church. It does not save you. I, I think in the midst of remembering Jesus, there's something about grace that wells up within us in that moment, but, but there's nothing about that that saves me. It is simply me approaching the table and identifying that I live in the future place with my king because he made a way for me. I can sup with him. You're going to go home and say that all day now, aren't you? I can sup with him because he's given me a seat at his table. <laughs> and, and maybe today when you come to the, to the table of peace, Maybe you need to do what Isaiah says, what, what will happen on that day. Maybe the simple thing to do today when you approach the table is to inquire of the Lord. To inquire. To petition. To release. To express. Lord, give me your wisdom and heart. Maybe you already know what his wisdom and heart is, but you need his power to move in it. Lord, I know I need to do this, but you know I can't on my own. Give me your strength and your peace to engage and embrace a way of peace in my life. Can we do that today? Can we do that? Let's pray and approach the table with boldness this morning. Jesus, thank you for being our peace. You made peace and not war with us. <laughs> you, you're going to end all wars. You, you've already defeated the enemy. And so, Lord, in these skirmishes that carry on in our lives, would we invite the person of peace into them today? Lord, would you help us to move from the table today empowered by your peace, by your hope, by your joy, and by your love. And Lord, help us to live a life that is anticipating and awaiting the arrival of our King because He's here, He's with us, and He's coming. So we pray that right now in your name this morning. Amen.
We just praise you, Father, for this time together. Just be with us as we leave here. Protect us as we go. And just let us have a great week in Christ's name. Amen. Don't forget the star tree. Grab lots of stars. Let's get them gone today. Y'all have a great week.